morning and it's a an absolute privilege and honour to be with you on the 60th anniversary of AFANS. What I propose to do uh, for you today is take you through some aspects of the book that I wrote on the Banking Royal Commission, Bolcher City, How Our Bankers Got Rich on Swindles, and touch on a few other things that relate to ethics and corporate governance as I go through. Uh, you should see a slide pack come up reasonably shortly um, on screen, and I will take you through uh, that as we go along. Now, first thing, First things first, one of the things that irritated me during the uh, process of uh, watching the Hain Royal Commission was this insistence people had that the banks uh, were supposed to have learned something from the Royal Commission. Well, I'm not sure that that's really the case because they're the ones who ended up telling us what they were doing, okay? So I premised this presentation on the fact that banks actually understood what it is they were doing wrong and the rest of us were busy learning on the run. Janine Parrott, uh, some of you would know, is a, a journalist who's had 41 um, years looking at the, the area of business and politics. This is her tweet from April of 2018. It's kind of a bit ancient now, but the point being, all we have to do is look at history. If you look at my book on Vul uh, Vulture City, what you will see, I refer to material written around about 1907 with uh, Edward Allsworth Ross talking about the whole area of white collar crime, but we hadn't got to the point where white collar crime was defined as white collar crime. Uh, he created some kind of being called the criminaloid, someone who wasn't quite a criminal, a thug on the street, but sat between being halfway de a halfway decent person, normal, uh, versus something particularly evil, someone that committed violence. Ross's work then led to a range of other things that were done in the area of studying white collar crime. So I recommend if you've got students or you're looking at this area yourself to go back and look at the work done by Edward Allsworth Ross, because I think you'll find that quite illuminating. Now, my book charts a range of things. We don't have a lot of time. You know, we're here for a good time, not a long time. So we don't have a lot of time to go through absolutely everything I've dealt with in the book. But what we'll do is look at uh, several issues, one of which is the behavioural aspects of what the bankers had done. Now, some of you will be familiar with it, others not so. What you have to understand is it took a while for the Royal Commission to be uh, put forward or proposed by the government. Numerous parliamentary inquiries were held, numerous pieces of evidence were presented, numerous appearances were made by the whistleblower Jeff Morris, but at the end of the day, what it took for the government to actually agree to put a Royal Commission on was the fact that the banks wrote a nice letter to Scott Morrison saying we need one because our reputations will be in tatters, if they weren't already, of course. What you've also got is a pressure uh, that was mounted on the government by the National Party. You see, the coalition partner was getting restless. These guys in the regions were seeing stories emanate from the farming communities that merited further action from the government, but it wasn't happening. What wasn't happening uh, quickly enough. There's one thing you might remember. Malcolm Turnbull, when he was PM, woke up one morning after a Four Corners program and decided he would have a, uh, have a Royal Commission into the Don Dale. Um, youth Detention Centre up in the Northern Territory. In 2014, Adele Ferguson and the Four Corners team produced a particularly revealing uh, program dealing with the issue of uh, the CBA at Commonwealth Bank and the way it dealt with customers and how its uh, employees were treated. There was no Royal Commission then. So this is about power, this is about politics. It's not always about the victims. And that's something you need to bear in mind as we progress. 
Here's a brief slide that um, uh, covers up the statistics, you know, colour by numbers. You will see that there were a raft of uh, 134 witnesses, 69 sitting days, and I will draw your attention to what is the bullet point that deals with almost 400 witness statements and more than 6,500 documents tendered. Those of you that have students doing research in the area of financial services, ethics, professional behaviour, need to encourage them to go and mine that material for further evidence for their research, if it's relevant, because it's all publicly available and it is all very, very solid material. You'll see board, meet, board meeting notes from banks. You'll see cons consulting reports from the major accounting firms, things you don't normally see in the context of uh, what uh, people would be doing in terms of research. You don't have to go begging. You don't have to go uh, arguing for access. You've got it. Now, uh, what I've mentioned a few of the teaching tools um, in this particular uh, context of the Royal Commission. So what you might do is take time to have a look at all of that. I know there are papers dealing with corporate governance at AFANS uh, over the next day or so. Those of you that are researching in the area of corporate governance and ethics will find some of this a benefit. So please take it, take your time and have a look at have a look at that material. What did the Royal Commission cover? And what are the areas into which all this governance and ethical stuff fell? Well, they covered banking home loans, credit cards, that sort of stuff. Financial advice, which is where my next book is coming up, uh, called Rorts and Ripoffs, just something slightly tabloidy. Uh, but it, I'll be looking at the way in which financial advice works and what people need to uh, do to avoid getting you know, hurt by the wrong sort of advisor. So financial advice was, was there, SMEs, you know, how small businesses got loans and what banks did and didn't do appropriately in that context. Superannuation, which we're seeing a lot of uh, at the moment in the press because of the early access that people have to you know, at least uh, 20 grand or 10 grand now, but 20 grand in aggregate over the 2018, uh, 2019, 20 rather, and 20 to 21 uh, financial years. Uh, we'll see a lot of stories of rorts and fraud coming from the superannuation sector as a result of the early access uh, issues, predominantly as a result of people not being very careful about how they manage their ID, not switching on multi-factor uh, authentication and all that sort of thing. Uh, you've got agriculture, insurance, and of course, the regulatory and policy framework. Those of you who watch the Royal Commission uh, fairly closely will find that the RSC received evidence from various people in the banks. Some of those issues that were raised directly concerned the ethics involved in you know, dealing with uh, dealing with the customers and the way in which customers were somewhat brutally dealt with from time to time. Okay. This is where the rubber hits the road. The top uh, case study, which is Jeff Morris and the Three Ferrets, would be familiar to you. Jeff Morris joined the Commonwealth Bank in the late 2000s. He'd also uh, been a senior executive in other financial institutions. I interviewed Jeff in the process of writing Vulture City and Jeff actually told me he was going to the Commonwealth Bank for a quieter time. I don't think that's what he ended up getting, and I suspect you would agree with me. Several things fell out of this particular uh, set of scenarios for Jeff Morris. One of them is that he was subjected to a lot of victimization within the bank when he and others began to push and agitate 
within a culture that was driven by a performance criteria that set, in essence, you need to make more money. That is how you will get rewarded. She had a range of advisors and others within the bank who were following, shall we say, orders of management because the performance criteria and the pressure on individuals was to sell. In terms of being a whistleblower, Jeff Morris was well equipped to be able to take on a lot more than the average person might in a particular institution. If you look at his CV, which uh, I've got you know, summarised in the book, but you can find it online uh, in his parliamentary evidence uh, if you go looking for it. Uh, but the 2013-2014 parliamentary committees that looked into the matter, what you will find is that Jeff was a senior uh, manager in, in a raft of organisations. He came with a particular moral compass to this particular role. So there was a part of him that wasn't willing to let a culture that he saw as being corrupted take things over. And that's important to keep in mind. He's walked in, he's having a fight with the various people in the bank that are looking at the people they report to and the people they report to look further up the hierarchy. What were the reward, what was the reward system? Commissions and bonuses. One of the disturbing elements of what I wrote about the Morris case study and the three ferrets, there, there, there were two others that went in uh, to fight alongside Jeff um, and trying to persuade ASIC to look at this stuff. One of the most disturbing elements was the account of a training session where people were told not to disclose the fact that a customer could avoid paying a particular component of a, uh, of a fee unless the customer asked the question. In other words, omission by silence. Every one of those folks sitting in the room knew what they were being told and if they complied with it, knew precisely what they were doing. If you look at the Peep Nose service scandal, you've got this AMP and CBA, in particular AMP, which you're seeing in the press again, for other reasons uh, that relate to um, the appointment of an individual that had previously been disciplined for uh, harassment at the workplace. The AMP and CBA both had fee for no service elements before the Royal Commission. The AMP in particular parked accounts that had been sold back to the institution by an advisor. They parked them, but they didn't park the skimming of, you know, the fees while someone wasn't being serviced by an agent. They just kept things ticking away. It altered over time. But somebody decided it was a bright idea to, to pull more money from customers while things are happening along the way. We know about the charging of, of dead people, uh, which was always something that was kind of a bit curious uh, curious to me observing the the process the independent report from amp the independent report from a law firm was it truly independent or was it uh, a report that was partly directed by the client this area is somewhat sensitive within the accounting world as well because once the royal commission reported and once Adele Ferguson wrote her book, uh, Banking Bad, which was released in, in August of 2019, there was a story in there about the way in which um, the NAB and EY went through the process of a risk management framework uh, deep dive analysis. And at the core of that particular discussion was the question of whether you know, the, the, the EY, the end product given to the bank by EY was completely independent. Somehow the journalists had gotten what uh, were clearly internal documents from EY that showed 
the uh, the progression of the way in which things were written up and filed. Now, I can't assess that as somebody who's looked at the profession over 26 years, whether or not everything was given to the journalists who wrote the story. Um, having not seen the documentation, I can't say much more other than it's been an issue that was noticed. It's been raised to the parliamentary committee. Um, I can't assess that independently of what the journalists that have written about it have said. Uh, and I'd like to do that at some stage if it were at all possible, because it would be interesting to see how, uh, how the fact pattern developed rather than how it was told. One of the things in journalism, one of the things that you as readers need to be aware of is journalists uh, align the facts with what they believe to be the important issues in that situation. If you were investigating a situation as a, as a person from a disciplinary part of a professional body or a regulator, you may not look at it the same way as the journalist might. It's worthwhile contemplating that. Uh, you have the Dover CEO who collapsed in the, the, the dock. And that, that vision was powerful. But one of the things that you need to bear in mind with that case study was not just the shock horror of um, the CEO's collapse, that Terry McMaster's collapse in the dock. What you've also got to remember is that he took on people who were, disab who were progressively being the subject of discipline by the organisations for which they worked. It wasn't a particularly uh, edifying situation for him, um, nor was it a, a really uh, easy thing for people to be, to be doing and, and looking at. So let me just go back one. I've hit the wrong button. Apologies for that. The aggressive sales tactics, which was what we've spoken about um, earlier, but that was mainly the theme coming through hand. Aggressive sales tactics, greed, performance measures, creating the impression of an entity that was all about creating a successful environment for those people that were busily um, investing in a bank or the superannual or in institutional investors that were also being uh, looking at banks, looking at success rates, everything else. The Baptist minister's son was a particularly galling one. For those of you who know me, know I'm partially deaf. I was born with a rare disorder. So anything to do with people who are um, whether it be intellectually disabled or, or, or their health has been impacted in some way, always galls me. Uh, the Baptist minister's son was sold during a phone call by a fairly um, cluey salesperson, an insurance policy. There was no way that that person would not have known that the individual concerned now, the individual they were talking to was not intellectually impaired. Evidence was tendered before the Royal Commission. The father um, was always aware of what his son was doing. This transaction appeared out of the blue. Uh, there was material that came from the insurer involved uh, as post to the, uh, to the family home. There was no idea as to how uh, this could have happened. Clearly, the son got talked into doing something that wasn't particularly suitable for his circumstances. It took a while for the insurer to actually deal with this properly. You know, the father had to get the son in some form, state of mind to be able to, um, one, understand firstly what needed to be done, secondly, confirm with the insurer once that understanding had been reached that they wanted to cancel the product. It was a galling instance. And when you look at what some of the uh, 
so-called disciplinary proceedings were, when you read the evidence, it's clear that some of these characters were actually also encouraged to sell harder. How in heaven's name do you do that in that situation? That's a diff that was a difficult case study to look at. Most of you will know about the area of self-managed super funds, either specifically or uh, know a bit about it. So what I'll do is I'll deal with the bread and breakfast example, which is also one that was rather curious. A couple wanted to set up a bed and breakfast. They went to their bank, spoke to their financial advisor, who said it was all possible. They wanted to do it in the self-managed super fund. Advisor said, yeah, like, we could deliver. What they didn't know, because they failed to understand the superannuation law as it applied to self-managed super funds, was there was no way they could do it. It was impossible for them to do it. And yet the advisor pulled them in uh, to the web and encouraged them to, believe it or not, pay for insurance for what was ostensibly an empty box. There was nothing in their fund other than a fund. They were still looking for a property to invest in in this meagre superannuation that they had while some character was you know, getting more through the front door. This was that the couple ended up having to sell the home in which they had a mortgage uh, in order to try and follow this strategy. They paid off debt. They didn't get around to paying off all of their debt. But they ended up in a situation where they had to rent property while they were searching for this farm or some property to, that they wanted to put into a self-managed super fund to run a bed and breakfast. Nobody had sat with them and spoken to them about the sole purpose rule. That is, you are not allowed to do any of this. The only way in which you would be able to put a bed and breakfast in there or put a property in there is if it was a property that you were involved in that was essentially there to help you grow your retirement funds, not for you to live in. These guys got ripped off. It took a while for them to get some kind of form of restitution. They did, but they were permanently scarred. Some of you may remember the evidence of uh, Mrs. McDowell, who cried in the in the stand when she was quizzed by uh, Rowena Raw, the QC. And the, the QCs during the Royal Commission were made for spectacular viewing, largely because most of the time it was shooting fish in a barrel for them. They knew what they were looking for and they could hit the target pretty well. That didn't mean it wasn't uh, an interesting piece of television. Home loan fraud uh, is an area that uh, I'll be writing about again in the context of the next book, Rorts and Ripoffs. Have a look at uh, some of the material, if you're just working on this from a research standpoint, from the the NAB introduced the scandal. The NAB effectively had a crime cell in, in various parts of Sydney working together to uh, make, it, uh, make it difficult for people who had gotten a loan, loan approved. There were false documents issued. Uh, uh, there was you know, claims made on uh, the bonus system for referrers that weren't justified because things were simply not done properly. This isn't a mere sort of professional slight. This is criminal conduct. You're talking about organised crime within the banking network. Yes, it's small. Yes, it's... But that is effectively what these guys were doing. Not that people like uh, associating that kind of terminology with a professional culture, but that is what they were doing. And until we start talking that way, we've got problems on our hands. 
Now, it, this is from the interim report that Kenneth Hain put out in September of uh, 2018. It's a, a couple of statements that are a useful focus. And there's a counterpoint coming, which I'll get to in a moment, from the Finance Sector Union, uh, based on some of their research. You can see that Haynes spoke about the fact that too often it became the sole focus of detention. That is aggressive selling. That products and services multiplied and the banks were looking for more money from every single, every single encounter. Now, I would hate to think what happened to those employees at the ANZ Bank every time I would bowl up with my passbook to either put money on my pay card or, uh, or look at deposits or look at other things, what happened every time they failed to deliver. I did an interview for my podcast series called Critical Line Item. You can find it absolutely everywhere with Julia Angrisana uh, from the Finance Sector Unit. She's the National Secretary. Uh, she basically said that in the banks themselves, what staff endured was incredible. They had to put up with you know, managers who would have names on whiteboards Who's selling more? Who's selling less? It became a question of not just professional performance, but staff humiliation. It's extraordinary. But, and when you talk to people on, who have been affected by this, what you find is if you're not selling, if you're not meeting the target, it becomes a performance management issue. So their jobs and their ability to put money on the table for their family are under threat. Doesn't sound like an ethical outcome, does it? But that is what the guys have been up to. That is what they were doing. And you can't, you can't countenance that in any way, shape or form. Greed. Um, I borrowed from some words from Wall Street the movie, some of you will recall it, you know, Charlie Sheen and um, uh, Michael Douglas, Gordon Gekko, you know, the whole greed is good thing. Um, but it's not necessarily solely greed for some people, it's actually self-preservation. Um, we're crossing into a territory where some individuals were not able in any way, shape or form uh, to do anything else within that culture if they believed there was no other option for them uh, in terms of work. This is actually a serious problem and we're going to have to see how people deal with it. Let me get, move on to... Enter the finance sector union. The point that Hain looked at the whole concept of greed driving the process and looked at the impact of the drivers related to greed on the consumer. In other words, what we would call misconduct in financial services. The finance sector union wasn't particularly happy with everything the Hain or commission you know, pulled up and pulled together. Why? There were some issues that were not properly explored by the Hain Rule Commission. And that is the impact of the manner of the behaviour of the institutions towards staff. Much of what Hain had dealt with was the notion of misconduct, uh, what happened to the people who engaged in misconduct, what happened to the consumers that were the victims of misconduct and how misconduct ought to be dealt with going forward. There's even a, 
a revi proposed revised model for the regulation of financial services professionals, which to those of us who've watched the profession for many decades would be familiar. Why? Hain proposed individual registration for financial services professionals, that is financial planners and advisors, so that it's easier to monitor them and it's easier to get rid of their meal ticket. Where does that exist in other parts of our regulatory structure? Auditors already do it. If you're going to do an audit under the Corporations Act of some significance, you're going to have to be a registered company auditor. Tax agents already do it. If you're going to provide tax advice and get paid for it and also lodge tax returns on, the, on behalf of others, you've got to be registered. So that model proposed by Hain isn't particularly revolutionary. It relies on the structures that already exist. But that model also dealt with the fact that there were aspects of financial planning regulation or disciplinary action rather, that were not to his satisfaction. There was a case study involving Sam Henderson. Some of you might have watched Sky Business over the years. He was an anchor um, on one of their advisory programs. He was also uh, a prominent columnist. And his firm was Henderson Mac Maxwell. Don't go looking for it now. It's dead, gone, wiped off the face of the earth. He now sells gift boxes to people who want to sort of provide people with you know, presents which is just a little bit different to providing financial advice. And that is where Hain got to on, on the issue of discipline, because the FPA didn't move quickly enough. And there were lawyers involved in that case study and all of that. So he's proposed a revision to that, but it's not nothing original in it, other than you know, register individuals so that you can deal with them easily and take them off the, take them off the pitch. The finance sector union, on the other hand, is deeply concerned about the impact of employees. They used a couple of, uh, three individuals actually, I interviewed them for a podcast as well, which you can see on my uh, podcast site on, on the ACAST platform. Um, John Bottomley and Brendan Byrne. Brendan Byrne is actually an ex-FSU official. What Brendan Byrne and John Pottomley told me was the work they did demonstrated that employees were deep sort of ethical beings, okay? And bear in mind, both John and Brendan come from uh, the background where they're uh, ministers in the Uniting Church. Now, this is a different kind of emphasis on ethics that you'll see flow through from the finance sector union uh, and given who they're using to put the report together. It's actually a very good way of looking at it. They reported uh, some responses from the membership of the FSU in a recent report. And one of the interesting factors is that banks did do things uh, in a manner that was contrary to their written codes and contrary to what the staff wanted to do. There's a clash between the profit base culture that they looked at and as well as the fact that the, the values that the employees had uh, were, um, were just clashing. They felt uncomfortable going to work when they knew that was what they were going to have to do to customers. The conduct of the banks, by the way, is criticised in part because of the drivers of capitalism. Now, we don't have a lot of time to go into that, but it's worthwhile looking up the report uh, on the Finance Sector Union website, um, and that will be very, very useful for people. There's a few other areas we need to consider. We know what it's under pressure. We know what it's been looking at looked at um, by uh, a parliamentary committee. Auditors and others were not a part of the Banking Royal Commission, but 
they've been hauled in before parliamentary committee simply because it's an area that people have been talking about, particularly um, you know, the interaction between NAB and EY, which became a news item, and then all of a sudden that became a part of the parliamentary committee hearings work. ASIC is continually looking at issues arising from the Hand Royal Commission. Maintain and watch on the ASIC, uh, ASIC website. One of the things that you'll, you will be seeing highlighted more often is ASIC's why not litigate approach. That's going to be interesting because there will be things ASIC cannot litigate. This is sabre rattling. There are things in audit that it could not litigate. It needs to come up with its severity scale when it does audit inspections which it said it will do before it can enter into that kind of um, that kind of prosecution properly. One of the criticisms of ASIC in the audit, audit inspection space is there's been no notable prosecutions. Well, the reason that's the case is there may not be a lot for ASIC to prosecute if the transgressions are minor or the firms have got half decent documentation and there's just an intellectual disagreement between the commission and the firms in it and the firms themselves. And what we've got is a case of deja vu for me. I've seen this happen over 26 years and it'll continue happening. Um, we've got journalists looking at the issues who haven't seen them before typically. Okay. That's part of the challenge. They can't interpret it from the basis of history. They're, they're looking at it in the here and now. So ASIC compla ASIC's complaints about audit quality are a, a product of a couple of things. And it's also a product of the financial services stuff I wrote about in, in Vulture City. Is the law sufficient? Is there adequate enforcement? If you've got good law, why can't you enforce, enforce the law? And that becomes a part of the... Uh, a part of the issue that needs to be examined more readily. Um, one of the things that occasionally comes up in discussion with you know, old school journalists who are no longer active is that they say to me, look, every time they spoke to uh, people at the ACCC or ASIC or wherever, there'd be times they say, well, all we can do is issue a media release. The regulator warns. Why? Because they know that their ability to prosecute isn't always uh, there. They don't have a, an infinite amount of funds to chase people through the courts. So how do they manage some of that task? They scare the hell out of people. Alan Fells is a classic at the, at the uh, competition regulator when he was a czar back then. Um, scaring people in order to generate compliance because you may, while you may have the law behind you, you may not have sufficient funds in the tank to prosecute everything. And that's the other issue with, with corporate conduct, corporate governance and professional ethics. It's all very well to have our codes in place. It's all very well to have ABS 110 in place. But what do we do when people transgress them? Do we pursue them? How do we deal with that? Because until there is a cost to non-compliance and if people are convinced that they can get away with failing to follow the rules or cut corners, then we are going to have a major problem on our hands. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, closing, coming to, to the close of what I want to chat to you about today, 49, 45 minutes isn't the longest time uh, in the world. Uh, but what I wanted to do was, again, reiterate. The Hain Royal Commission produced a whole raft of material for you and your students to look at. You don't have to pay for it. You can go and look at various corporate governance issues and corporate governance um, uh, ideas, look at the financial services sector, rip apart board documents, rip apart evidence. More importantly, 
as an educational re resource, encourage students to rip apart, apart consultants' reports. All of these things are freely available to you. I know we have a problem with ASIC and getting access to financial statements. That is going to be a continuing problem until uh, ASIC and others uh, are persuaded that it makes great sense to provide free access to those particular uh, platforms for you know, researchers and the community. Because the laws aren't just there to give ASIC you know, a, um, a fill up in terms of consolidated revenue. Laws related to transparency are meant to be there so that you and I and anyone else engaging with companies are able to look at financial statements and understand who we're dealing with. We can't do that um, with every single entity that's in the ASIC lodgement space, particularly given, uh, given that we uh, have to pay for it. So there, there is a barrier to entry. I encourage you to look at some of Michael West's work. Michael West, journalist that looks at tax as well. Um, he's consistently pointed out that it costs about $40 per set of accounts to be able to analyze an entity properly. The Hain Royal Commission provides you with a raft of material. Don't waste the opportunity to uh, explore what's there. It's free. You're also able to download the entire website if you use the uh, if you use specific software designed to pull down the entire site while I was writing the book this is a good good little thing for researchers while I was writing the book I was able to download all the PDFs but have them set up in the individual folders replicate the folder structure on the Royal Commission website, so that when I went looking for things that happened on a particular day or were tended on a particular day, as described in the report, I was able to do that. You don't need to go back to the website all the time. You should be able to get yourselves uh, a, a bit of hard drive space and do it that way. I realize we're coming close to the end of the session. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a thrill to be able to talk to people at AFENS again. I know it's been a long time uh, between drinks for me. So I thank Jacqueline Burt and the board for having me along. Thank you and all of you for attending. And I hope that you enjoy the remainder of this virtual AFANS conference uh, as much as you possibly can, because it's, um, it is, uh, one of those rare occasions where you are able to have an exchange with, with colleagues who have similar interests from other institutions. So thank you for joining me.